fetching video stream. Go live. Hello, this is Robert Jones. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, who is watching or who will be watching on the uh, recording. Uh, this is another segment in our look at the Crusades. Uh, today is the big one, the third Crusade. I don't know if we'll get the whole thing done today because this will include um, little biographies of Richard the Lionheart and uh, uh, Saladin. So uh, we will get started on it. We are broadcasting from a secret location on the Kennesaw Ackworth border. We do have a studio audience with us. Yay! And that was them in the background. <laughs> At uh, 10.30, it's 10.01 now, uh, we'll be shifting over to uh, Ed LeCompte, who will have a message for us. Uh, but we'll start out with uh, the Crusades. So um, if we look at our, our little schedule for this course, uh, we are in Crusades 1 through 8, uh, the, the middle one there. And uh, as I already said, we're on number 3. So... Number three features the heavyweight fight of the century, fight of the epic in the Middle Ages between the two greatest warriors. The greatest Christian warrior is Richard uh, Coeur de Lyon, Richard the Lionheart. Uh, the greatest uh, Muslim warrior is Al Saladin. And this is the Thrilla in Manila uh, of its day. And uh, it kind of works out in a draw. Right? You can't really say one defeated the other. So we'll start out with a, a view, a Muslim view of Richard the Lionheart, which will actually explain something extraordinary, which happens later. Uh, this Richard, King of England, performed such deeds of prowess when he was in the Holy Land that the Saracens, that's the Muslims, on seeing their horses frightened at a shadow or bush, cried out to them, What? Dost think King Richard is there? This they were accustomed to say from the many and many times he had conquered and vanquished them. In like manner, when the children of the Turks or Saracens cried, their mother said to them, Hush, hush, or I will bring King Richard of England to you. And from the fright these words caused, they were instantly quiet. So the Third Crusade, uh, 1187 to 1192, so five years long, one of the longer Crusades. England and France were at war with, with each other in the late 12th century. Of course, they seem to be at war with each other through much of the latter part of the Middle Ages. But at the same time, in the 1170s, the greatest foe of the Crusaders was gaining power in Egypt. Uh, Al-Saladin, or Saladin as is often called in English. If you look at the, uh, the painting on the right side of the slide, it shows Richard I uh, fighting at Accra. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So in July 1187, near the Sea of Galilee, Saladin defeats Crusader armies at what is known as the, the Battle of Hattan. Um, the Crusader army is essentially wiped out. They're either killed or they're captured. This is Saladin's greatest moment as a leader and as a warrior. As a matter of fact, it was so uh, such a lopsided victory for Saladin uh, some people thought that the uh, Crusaders uh, were done in the Holy Lands. Uh, it's sometimes, by the way, called the Horns of Hatton, the battle, uh, because of the uh, geographical uh, items at the site. Because he had destroyed the Crusader army, uh, a few months later, October 2nd, 1187, Saladin seized Jerusalem. So ever since the First Crusade, the Crusader armies had held Jerusalem. Now they did no more. Most Christian inhabitants are allowed uh, to be ransomed uh, after Saladin takes it. This is certainly in distinction to when the Crusaders took it in the First Crusade, where they not only killed all the Muslims, they killed all the Jews they could find. The cross from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, was dragged to the streets for two days. The bells of Christian churches were melted down. Uh, there is another wonderful painting showing Saladin and Guy de Lusignon, who was the uh, head of the Crusader army at the time, and obviously he is uh, surrendering. 
And so why did uh, Guy de Lusignon, why did, was his army defeated so, so horribly? Uh, one of the reasons was they were out in the middle of the desert and they didn't have any water. But there were other reasons also. So there was a movie that came out a few years ago called Kingdom of Heaven, and it just happens to be about this very thing, about the Battle of the Horns of Hatton. So uh, I did this a few years ago, and most of you have probably forgotten that movie even existed, but e either way, we're going to talk about it now. Uh, so how historically accurate is that movie? So it's a 2005 film directed by Ridley Scott. It was a big budget uh, film. It started Orlando Broom, Bloom. Jeremy Irons, Liam Neeson, and uh, Eva Green. And it covers the three years just prior uh, before the Third Crusade. And it's reasonably accurate for a Hollywood movie. There was a, a big budget movie on the Crusades in the 1950s, and it was really bizarre because it had the Crusader armies fighting along with Saladin rather than against them. Uh, so that one wasn't so great. But Kingdom of Heaven, uh, reasonably accurate. So uh, in the film, Baldwin IV, uh, played by Edward Norton, uh, is the, portrays the king of Jerusalem. Now Baldwin IV had leprosy and he died uh, without an heir in 1185. He did have a sister named uh, Sibylla, uh, who of course is portrayed by Eva Green. Sibylla is eventually crowned king and makes her husband Guy of Lusignon, uh, or she's crowned queen, I'm sorry, and makes her husband, uh, Guy de Lusignon, the king. And that's how Guy ends up as the head of the Crusader armies. Now, you will notice that Guy de Lusignon is no Richard the Lionheart. Battle of the Horns of Hatton, uh, fairly accurately displayed in the movie. Lack of water is a key reason for the Crusader defeat. Uh, Guy de Lusignon is captured by Al Saladin. Uh, Saladin really did personally execute one of Guy de Lusignon's commanders, Reynaud de Chatillon. I love those French names, even if I can't pronounce them very well. Uh, Saladin uh, certainly did take uh, Jerusalem after a brief, brief siege, and Saladin and Abelian of Ibelin did parley before the city was surrendered. So all that stuff is true. Uh, also true, Saladin did let most of the inhabitants of Jerusalem live, as we've already discussed. And there were tension between crusaders who lived in the Holy Lands and new recruits regarding how to interact with the Moslems. Now, not surprisingly, the crusaders who lived in the Holy Lands over the period of years and decades had kind of learned to live with their Moslem neighbors and they somewhat got along. New recruits, fresh off the boat, if you will, uh, would come marching in ready to kill any Moslem that they saw. So that's portrayed in the movie and that's, that's pretty true. Um, now, there's some things that perhaps aren't totally accurate or some omissions in the movie, Kingdom of Heaven. There's no mention of Saladin holding Jerusalem captives for ransom. Uh, they kind of uh, make him look like he's uh, uh, Santa Claus or something. Saladin was not respectful of Christian symbols, as we already mentioned. Uh, the Siege of Jerusalem is probably overplayed as a battle. Um, not as big as the, the battle in the First Crusade. And the movie had an obvious, and this is going to shock everyone, I know. The movie had an obvious dearth of religious context, especially as a motive for the Crusader Knights. I know that's shocking to everyone. According to the movie, you would think that all the Crusaders were only there to make money or, or, or whatnot. Uh, but believe it or not, some of the Crusaders actually uh, were doing it uh, for their religion. Uh, in the movie, Balian of Ibelin marries uh, Marie Comnena, widow of King Almorak. There is no proof whatsoever that he had an affair with Sibylla of Jerusalem. But you know, since Eva Green was playing Sibylla of Jerusalem, uh, they had to have a major part for her in the movie. Uh, and the movie says uh, Balian of Ibelin was a bastard. He wasn't. His father was Barisan of Ibelin. Uh, he was allied with uh, Guy de Lusignon, so that was correct. He wasn't French. And he wasn't a blacksmith. He's probably Italian. And he didn't retire to France after the fall of Jerusalem. He helped fortify Beirut against Moslem attack. And he was present when the truce with Saladin was signed. The movie gives the impression that after Jerusalem fell, he returned home to become a simple blacksmith. Again, uh, which he had never been in the first place. Okay, back to reality in the Third Crusade. 
So in two years, Saladin took 50 Crusader castles. I mean, the guy was unstoppable. Uh, well, until Richard the Lionheart stopped him. So Pope Gregory VIII and the Archbishop of Tyr issued appeals for help. And this time, three heavyweights take up the cross. First is Richard the Lionheart uh, of England. And this is the first time that England joined the Crusades. Philip Augustus II of France. Now remember, England and France are at war. <laughs> so Richard and Philip hate each other. But now they're, they're going on a crusade together. And then, of course, the famous Frederick Barbarossa of Germany. If all three of these had come together in uh, the Holy Lands and had fought against the Moslems as a unit, uh, then everything might have turned out differently. Uh, another wonderful painting showing the embarking, um, embarkment of King Philip II of France for the Third Crusade. And you can see the, the soldiers uh, making their way onto the ships. Uh, there's a monument to Barbarossa in, uh, in Germany, sitting on the throne. Well, as I said, uh, if uh, all three of them had been together, Nothing could have stopped them, but on June 1190, Frederick Barbarossa drowns in a river on his way to the Holy Lands. 1191, Richard and Philip put aside their differences enough to take Accra after a long siege, and they use big stone-throwing catapults. As part of the negotiated settlement, the Muslims were supposed to return the relic of the Chute Cross, seized by Saladin's troops in 1187, as well as some Christian prisoners. Uh... If every bit of the true cross, of the cross that Christ died on, had been assembled by the end of uh, the Crusades, it would have been the size of the Empire State Building. Uh, progress went too slow for Richard's liking, and he had 2,700 Muslims massacred in sight of Saladin's army. Now, needless to say, that did not help quell tensions in the Holy Land. So let's talk a little more about uh, Richard Coeur de Lyon. He's born in 1157. Uh, 1172, he's made Duke of Aquitaine. It's good to be the son of the king. 1173, uh, Richard and his brothers revolt against their father, Henry II, uh, with the full support of their mother and the French king. 1174, the revolt is quelled and a peace treaty specifically leaves out Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Richard begs forgiveness from his father, and it is granted. His father could have chopped his head off, and then the Third Crusade never would have been. 1180 to 1183, Richard again revolts against his father. Richard's older brother dies, oops, making Richard first in line for the throne. 1187, Richard allies himself with Philip II of France, and takes the cross at Tours. This is when he uh, decides to go to the Holy Lands. Uh, and leaving his weasel brother uh, back home in England uh, to manage affairs while uh, Richard's in the Holy Land. 1187, as we already mentioned, Saladin defeats the Crusader armies at the Battle of the Horns of Hatton and takes Jerusalem. 1189, uh, Richard and Philip II defeat Henry's army at Balans. And Henry dies shortly after. So, 1189, Richard the Lionheart is crowned King of England. The next year, he sets out for the Holy Lands, leaving regents to rule England in his absence. His weasel brother, John, is not one of the regents. September 1190, Richard and Philip II occupy Sicily. May 1191, Richard takes Cyprus. So, uh, within the space of a few months, Richard takes Sicily and he takes Cyprus. May 2nd, 1191, Richard marries Bereng Berengaria of Navarre in Cyprus, and he's crowned king of Cyprus. It's helpful when you take over a country if you want to become king. <laughs> June 1191, he lands at Accra. He's sick with scurvy. He didn't have uh, uh, multivitamins back then. He and his troops uh, help take Accra from the Muslims. Philip II returns to France. So, Barbarossa doesn't make it to the Holy Lands because he dies, 
and Philip goes to France, back to France, and so that leaves Richard in the Holy Lands. Summer of 1191, Richard orders 2,700 Muslim prisoners executed. We've already talked about that. September 7th, 1191, in a stunning victory that reverberates throughout history today, Richard defeats Saladin at Arsuf, which is south of Acre. And we're going to talk a little more about that in a moment. 1192, Richard takes Ascalon. And around that same time, um, there's a battle that almost happens at Joppa, uh, but doesn't really happen. And we'll talk about that in a moment. September 2nd, uh, 1192, Richard and Saladin sign a peace treaty because they can't figure out how to defeat each other. Richard feels pressure to return home because his weasel brother John is trying to usurp the crown. Christmas 1192, Richard is captured outside of Vienna by Leopold V, Duke of Austria, and held for ransom. March 28, 1193, Richard is turned over to Henry VI, Holy Roman Emperor, who continues to hold him for ransom. Pope uh, Celestine III excommunicates both Leopold V and Henry VI for detaining a crusader knight. And February 4th, 1194, Richard is released after England pays a huge ransom. Well, after their uh, successful um, coming together in the Crusades, Richard and Philip go back to fighting each other. 1194 to 1199, uh, war continues in France between Richard and Philip. And finally, Richard is killed by a crossbow uh, in France in 1199. Now, uh, the lad who killed Richard, he's like 17 or 18, I don't remember exactly. Uh, the uh, Crusader Knights told him, if you just surrender to us and tell us what you did, you'll be okay. So the kid, stupid enough, surrenders to them. And of course, they chopped his head off. So, Richard, third son of King Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine. He's made Duke of Aquitaine in 1172. Uh, in 1189, with both of his two older brothers dead. So what were the odds that Richard would assume the crown with, uh, uh, because his two older brothers were dead? Uh, Richard becomes king of England uh, when Henry II dies after a battle at Balance. Richard I takes a cross in 1187 and tours. On his way to the Holy Lands, he conquers Sicily and Cyprus. One of those he conquered because his sister was married to the leader of that uh, of the country, and uh, the leader was not treating his sister nicely. Uh, so Richard took over the the land. Richard and Philip uh, take Acre in 1191 after a long siege. Uh, we've talked about Richard massacring the 2,700 Muslim prisoners. Uh, there in that wonderful painting, we see the massacre of the Muslim hostages. Uh, you see the bodies uh, lying there. You see one of them about ready to be killed. Okay, now we move to Richard's greatest moments. After taking Acre, Richard turns south towards Jerusalem. Now, I said earlier, and I put this uh, very gently, that after the battle of uh, the siege of Acre, Philip II went home to uh, France. Well, the reason he went home to France is he couldn't stand being around Richard. So they had a big fight, and, and Philip took his army, and he went home. So, no Frederick Barbarossa, no German troops, no French troops. So the whole crusader mass to face Al Saladin, who has like 200,000 troops, is Richard the Lionheart of England, the Knights Hospitaliers, and the Knights Templar. The great battle at Arsuf happens on September 7th, 1191. And I'm going to show you a map in a moment. The, the position that Richard's troops were in was horrifying. The tipping point of the battle is when the Knights Hospitaliers make an unauthorized charge on the Saracen lines after having been attacked on two sides for hours. So Richard doesn't even order the, the key moment of the battle. Uh, but uh, once the Hospitaliers do their charge, then Richard, of course, is right there with them. Saladin's troops experienced 35% casualties in a battle which saw 700 Christian casualties to 7,000 for Saladin. Okay, here's a map. 
On the left, uh, you see uh, there's water. In the front is desert. And you will notice that uh, Al Saladin's troops surround Richard on two sides and there's water to the back of him. Uh, this is not a good position to be in from a tactical or strategic point of view to fight this battle. And yet it is Richard's greatest uh, victory. So, as well as numerous victories in France, Richard is credi credited with conquering or winning battles at Sicily, Cyprus, Accra, Arsuf, Joppa, and Ascalon. And I like this slide so much I put it in twice. <laughs> so uh, Richard is certainly the greatest Christian warrior of the Crusades. There's a wonderful uh, uh, photo of a statue of him at, uh, at Parliament. Uh, my niece Sarah uh, went in to take that picture and the area where it's in is now a, a car park for officials. And there were guys guarding the car park with automatic weapons. And Sarah shows up with her camera to take a picture for me. And they asked her why she was there. And she says, I'm here to take a picture for my uncle. <laughs> and she got that picture. Isn't that a great picture? While guys were there with automatic weapons. So, I should mention uh, one other thing about uh, the Lionheart before we go on to Saladin. So, you certainly can say he was a rotten son. He attacked his father, the king, twice. Uh, he's probably a rotten husband. He's a rotten king. I mean, you think about it, he's gone the whole time. He's either fighting in the Holy Lands or he's a prisoner, ransom. He's fighting in France. So he's a rotten king. So rotten son, rotten husband, rotten king. But he's the greatest military leader of the Crusades. And I promised I was going to mention a little more about Joppa. Well, after our sooth, uh, Richard of Lionheart uh, takes his, uh, his troops out to uh, Mediterranean on ships, and they come down to Joppa, which is being besieged by Saladin's army by this point. Now, the Hospitaliers uh, took the land route. Uh, they went south from our uh, by foot, but uh, all the English folk who were with the Lionheart, they, they took these ships. So they come in off the Mediterranean behind the, uh, the castle, the fort at Joppa, where the, uh, the Christian crusaders are. In front of the castle is arrayed uh, Saladin's massive army. Now, of course, there are some Muslim guards uh, on the seacoast, and they're looking to see uh, if, uh, if more crusaders are coming in. Well, according to Arab historians, so this didn't, didn't come from the Richard the Lionheart publicity department. This came from Arab historians. Supposedly, uh, Richard I was the first one to land, the first one off the boat. And when the Arab guards who saw who it was saw him, they ran away in terror back to Saladin to tell them that Richard the Lionheart had landed. Now, even with uh, the, the addition of the English troops, the Christians were still uh, outnumbered like 10 to 1 by Saladin's army. So, a few days later, Richard the Lionheart rides out in front of the fortification, in front of his troops, and I guess, I don't know, he's 100 feet from Saladin and his army, and Richard the Lionheart rides back and forth in front of Saladin's army. And he challenges anyone in the Muslim army to face him one or one. And he said he'll take as many of them who want to attack him as long as it's one at a time. And he includes Saladin. And he rides back and forth making this, uh, uh, making this taunt. And slowly Saladin's army, they start to ride away. <laughs> and they ride in the other direction. <laughs> until it's just Saladin and uh, his, uh, his bodyguards, and then they too ride away. Now again, this story comes from Arab historians. It doesn't come from the publicity department of the English Crusade. So Saladin, I don't know if we'll get completely through this, but we'll, we'll uh, move on. He's born in uh, Tikrit, which is modern day Iraq in 1137. He begins working for the ruler of Syria, Nur al-Din. 
1164, he becomes a military leader in Egypt under his uncle. 1169, uh, he kills Shawar, the vizier, to the Fatimid Caliph al-Aldid and becomes uh, the vizier himself. He also quells a revolt against him and he survives an assassination attempt. Forces under Saladin defeat a crusader Byzantine force near, uh, near uh, Damietta. 1170, Saladin attacks crusaders at Darim, Gaza, and the castle of Elot. November 1174, he captures Damascus and is crowned Sultan of Egypt and Syria. 1174 to 75, he conquers Hama and Homs in Syria. There's more uh, assassination attempts against him. 1176, he lays siege to the assassin fortress of Masyaf, but eventually withdraws. He goes on to capture Aleppo in Syria, captures Mosul in modern-day Iraq, and of course, uh, October 2nd, 1187, uh, he seizes uh, Jerusalem, and this is after he's defeated the Crusader, Crusader army at the Battle of Horns of Hatton. So this is uh, the greatest Muslim military leader of the Crusades. There is no question. This is a guy uh, that uh, modern-day uh, Al-Qaeda uh, Osama bin Laden patterned themselves after or who wanted to, to be the new caliph or the new sultan, uh, which is what uh, Osama bin Laden wanted to do. He wanted to follow in the footsteps of uh, Saladin. September 7th, 1191, Saladin suffers a stunning defeat at Arsif. Uh, a year later, Richard I and Saladin sign a peace treaty. Now, supposedly, Richard the Lionheart is in with, within sight of Jerusalem. He's got his army with him. He's got the Knights Hospitaliers. He's got the Knights Templar. So why doesn't he attack Jerusalem? The reason is you got a text message from England saying that his weasel brother John was trying to take over the crown. So even though Jerusalem is within sight and almost in his hands, he has to turn and ride away. And he leaves the Holy Lands and he never returns. Saladin dies a, a year later in Damascus of a fever. Uh, there's a, a two statues in Jerusalem showing Saladin and uh, Richard I. Again, the heavyweight uh, champions of the era. Uh, so Saladin is a Sunni Kurd born into Crete. Becomes a successful military leader in Egypt under his uncle. Becomes a vizier to the Fatimid Caliph. 1174, he becomes Sultan of Egypt. At its height, his empire includes Egypt, Syria, modern-day Iraq, Hejaz, uh, which is in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and parts of North Africa. 1169 to 70, he takes the lead in fighting against the Crusader armies in the Holy Lands. Um... Uh, the big victory over Guy de Lusignan at the Battle of the Horns of Hatton. Captured Jerusalem in 1187. Defeated by Richard in 1191 at the Battle of Arsuf. September 2nd, 1192, Richard and Saladin sign a three-year peace treaty uh, because uh, Richard's weasel brother John was trying to take over the kingdom. Saladin had a reputation as a gracious foe. Once in the heat of battle, Saladin saw that Richard's horse had been killed Saladin sent a groom with two fresh horses. Another time, upon learning that Richard was ill, Saladin sent him some fruit and ice. However, you will notice that Joppa, when Richard gave his uh, offer for anybody who wanted to come out and fight him one-on-one, mano a mano, Saladin did not come out. Coward. <laughs> However, that being said, Saladin is the uh, greatest... Uh, of all Muslim military leaders, he dies just six months after the truce with Richard is signed. And he's buried in Damascus. And that's a, a picture of his tomb early in the 20th century. So the Third Crusade, it's not as effective as the first. It's still a significant gain of territory by the Christian Crusaders. And Richard I and Saladin cemented their place in history as the greatest of the warriors in the Crusades. We got through it all in one day. Uh, next time we meet, we'll talk about the Fourth Crusade. And now I am going to turn it over to 
Ed LeCompte, who has a message for you. And uh, I need to expand this so we can see Ed. Ooh. <laughs> okay, now you cover the whole screen. Oh, <laughs> that's frightening. <laughs> Just a second. Technical glitch. Just a second. Apologize. All right. Good morning. Wonderful to be with you again. May I say what a privilege it is to be able to join with you again this beautiful Sunday morning that God has made to share with you God's Word. It's always a privilege and an honor to be able to share the Word of God with all, and we should never take it lightly uh, that we are, at least at the moment, free to read and study God's own Word in the form of the Bible. We need to make it part of our lives, a daily ritual, uh, to not just be familiar with the concepts of the Bible, uh, to admire it as literature uh, or just another book, but to delve into it, to study it, to read it, and to know it. Uh, there are too many people in our secular society today uh, who will denigrate it or tell you things that are in it that are not, or uh, worse yet, tell you things that are not in it that actually are. So, uh, if you're all... Uh, since you're all thinking people, open it, read it, study it, know it. Don't take my word for it. Uh, don't take your uh, pastor's word for it. Uh, your pastor should be a servant of the scriptures. And the scriptures are not the servant of the preacher, as they seem to be so commonly today. So our message this morning is called Spring Training. Uh, it seems appropriate following... Easter Sunday, and to build on uh, what we've been studying already the past few sessions, uh, to look at the life, death, resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, blessed are you above all. Endless is your love and patience for us. We are truly blessed to be part of Christ's universal church, and we are blessed by you for providing your word to us in the Bible. Only you are holy only you are God. Though we were given everything by you, we, re we rejected you and your word, becoming sinners and following a path that we wanted rather than what you wanted, and found nothing, at the, nothing but death at the end of it. In your infinite mercy, by your sovereign grace, you sent your Son, our one and only Savior, into the world to bear our sins and free us from death through his atoning death upon the cross and his resurrection. You call us and make us new again, and the old us passes away. We pray now that your word is heard here, that our eyes, ears, and hearts are open to your word, your grace, and your way. In your Son's most holy name, we humbly pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning uh, will come from the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Let us now listen to God's holy word. Who has believed who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground he had no, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces he was despised and we esteemed him not Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers are silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered what he was cut off of the land of the living, tricking for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall share, uh, bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. Our New Testament reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35, on the road to Emmaus. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not, does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who went with us, who were with us, went up to the tomb and found it just as, as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at a table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told them what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. May God bless this reading of his holy word. May our ears and eyes be opened and our hearts be softened to the word of the Lord. The journey of a thousand miles may well begin with a single step, but this time of year, the journey of 162 games begins with spring training. Rogers Hornsby once said, people ask me what I do in the winter when there's no baseball. I'll tell you what I do. I stare out the window and wait for spring. Well, the baseball season is underway now. Uh, even in the Bronx, where a late season snowfall postponed the Yankees home opener. My father always used to say, snow was a good thing in the Bronx. It made it disappear. <laughs> Spring training is a time for all players to come together and shake off the off season. New players are giving it their all to try and get a spot with the team, learning new things and working steadily on the basics. 
The veterans are coming back being reminded of the basics, using muscles that they may not have used for a while, and getting back into fighting trim. Springtime can be the same thing for Christians. Easter spring. For many Christians, Easter may be one of the two times a year that they attend services, if at all. Uh, the Christmas season is over. Winter's long nights and short days set in and we get comfortable in front of a nice warm fire or worse yet, in front of a television set. The winter blahs set in. It's a season of quiet and calm. Then the days begin to lengthen. A warmer breeze begins to blow. Uh, the government steals an hour of sleep from us, and the whole world begins to awaken again to the first signs of crocuses or the stink of the Bradford pear trees. So springtime should become the spring training season for Christians as well. We've been talking about comatose Christians uh, the last couple of meetings. The Easter season is an excellent time to get back into the working and get it back into working on the basic training of Christianity, to brush up on those skills you may not have used for a while, or if you're a rookie, to delve into the richness of basic Christian doctrine. You may have heard it said uh, that the Bible is a book about Jesus. The Old Testament is Jesus predicted, the Gospel is Jesus revealed, the Epistles is Jesus explained, and Revelation is Jesus anticipated. The Bible is not just another book. It is the Word of God. It has the power to change lives. As Charles Spurgeon used to say, it is a blood-stained book. William Tyndale was convicted of heresy and put to death for translating the Bible into English. It is a book of great power with a great message. Governments fear it, including our own. It has been banned, it has been burned, as, a, uh, as have its supporters. It's a subversive book. It's a book that has been rejected and spurned by mankind since its inception. It is nothing less than the inerrant word of God. It is also God's expectation of his rebellious people. As we have said it here before, no one lives by it will ever be put to shame. Anyone who keeps its commandments, and I mean all of its commandments, will ever have anything to apologize for, ever have to do a public mea culpa. The Bible is as basic as it gets. Hopefully you have a pastor in your life who performs expository preaching, as opposed to the myriad of preachers out there who like to think up something to say once a week on the way to church about some commercial they've seen or some experience they've had at a convenience store, and then tags one or two quasi-related Bible verses onto it uh, to turn it into some kind of sermon of sorts. Or worse yet, some political agenda someone is pushing uh, that may or may not even be related to any scripture that they have dragged out for this week, uh, or really any scripture at all for that matter. The Bible is the basics. The Bible is your playbook. You can't play the game if you don't know the playbook. Read it. I share it with you because I wish someone had shared it with me all the more so many years ago. And then there's that Jesus person. Well, what are we to do with Jesus? This is the greatest and most important decision a person can make in a lifetime. C.S. Lewis said, Now the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us the same way as the others, but with a tremendous difference that it really happened. Our Lord Jesus is, a, is an historical person. He existed and exists in history, and his presence in history changed the course of history forever. He was born, he lived, he died, and he was resurrected bodily to life. He was not a spirit. He is not merely resuscitated. Now at the time of Jesus's ministry, there were several different views of what the Messiah would be like, a warrior king who would reestablish the rule of the Jews and rebuild the temple. John deals with who Jesus was. Uh, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 through for, uh, 34. Behold the Lamb of God. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, the him being John the Baptist in this case, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. 
I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus shows us God's grace. Jesus shows us the gifts of redemption. No. Lord Jesus is not the bearer of God's message. Lord Jesus is God's grace, and he is God's redemption. William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, in an interview at the turn of the last century said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, heaven without hell. The eerie accuracy of this prediction is chilling. All of these predictions have come true over the past century. So, who is Jesus? You need to decide. Ligonier Ministries has an excellent statement on Christology. Uh, their their uh, statement goes as this, we confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us, crucified, dead, and buried. He rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. So, Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Christ. Jesus said in John 14, uh, verses 1 through 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a, uh, a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also uh, be also. And you know the way to where I am, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen, from now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus is central and essential to Christianity, despite what we may see today. Jesus was born, he lived, he performed miracles, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he suffered, he bore God's wrath for us, he physically died, his body was dead, the Holy Spirit raised him bodily, his physical body was regenerated, he walked, he talked, he ate with his disciples, he walked the earth for 40 days before his ascension into heaven, and he appeared to over 500 at one time. 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 15, verses 3 through 7, Paul writes, 
For I delivered to you of uh, first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Then Jesus ascended into heaven before their eyes. In Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you take at this time, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when, all the, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were standing there gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I kind of like that image of the apostles watching and the, the, two, uh, uh, the uh, two angels coming and saying, okay, what are you looking at? Let's get busy. So, where Christ lives today until his return. Uh, this is crucial difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. Jesus is alive and he lives with us today. Buddha is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Mary Baker Eddy is dead. Charles Russell is dead. Muhammad is dead. You can go see his bones if you want to. Want to. Uh, Jesus lives. And because he lives, so may we. You see, we all share in the fall of mankind. We do not live in a world uh, as it was intended by God. Our rebellion against God has led to sin, and our sin leads to death. What can we do about it? Nothing except through Christ, except Christ through his perfect sinless life became the perfect sinless sacrifice for all of us. He lived the life that Adam couldn't and became the second Adam. Fully God, fully man, he upon that cross at Calvary took upon himself all of our sin and suffered God's wrath that if we believe in him and put our faith in him, we may also be saved Justified, by, justified to God and resurrected to eternal life as well, fully and bodily, just as Christ was and is. As sinners, we are completely unable to reconcile ourselves to God. We are separated and estranged from him. We live in our sin and try to justify it in our own minds. Our comatose Christian friends will tell us, well, it's okay if you just try your hardest and do good because it will make you feel good inside, and that's really what's important, you know, helping others so we can feel good about ourselves. In the good old days, we could burn people at the stake for such heresy. Okay, put down your pens and paper. I'm not suggesting that we do that uh, yet, but uh, <laughs> I am making the point that heresy runs rampant in our society, and it stems directly from a lack of understanding of basic Christian doctrine. Oh, there's that doctrine word. Doctrine is boring. It's stodgy. It's just someone's opinion. Well, of course it isn't, and it's a great place to start, especially for spring training. Think of spring training. Keep your eye on the ball. Get in front of grounders. Use two hands to catch. I can't tell you how many times I've heard those words. John Calvin said, the church that doesn't catechize as well as teach scripture will not last. Spring training. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. What rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? The words of, the old, uh, the words of God, which are, is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. What do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. What is sin? Sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Who is the redeemer of God's elect? The only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ 
who, being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continueth to be God and man in two distinct natures, and one person forever. What, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? At the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. What is the duty which God requireth of man? The duty which God requireth of man is obedience to his revealed will. These are some of the basics. The Christian's spring training. What I was reading from was the Westminster Confession of Faith. If you find yourself bored on a rainy Saturday night, pull it out, dust it off. Highly recommend it. Uh, the Lord Jesus came down and was born a man, fully human and fully God, and upon taking on all of our sins, suffered and died on that cross to bear wrath that we so richly deserve that we may be forgiven upon Christ interceding for us when we stand and face judgment. Remember, God's wrath hasn't gone away. It's only through Jesus that the wrath has been transferred to him that we may live. And we will stand and face judgment. And as was Calvin's favorite priest of scripture, that began, he began every worship service with uh, Psalm uh, 124 verse eight, our help is in the name of the Lord. If you take nothing else away from this morning's message, take this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God did not have, us, have to send his son for us. He did not have to send him to his crucifixion for us on the cross. God did not have to send his son for us at all. He did not have to send him to crucifixion. Out of God's unending grace and mercy to his glory, God did these things 2,000 years ago to secure our salvation today. As Jonathan Edwards said in Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, you are a sinner before a holy God. Christ has flung open the door of mercy and Christ stands there and says, come home. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, blessed are you above all, endless is your love and patience for us. We are truly blessed to be part of Christ's universal church, and we are blessed by you uh, for providing your word to us in the Bible. Only you are holy, only you are God. Though we were given everything by you, we rejected you and your word, becoming sinners and following a path that we wanted rather than what you wanted for us, and found nothing at the end of it but death. In your infinite mercy, by your sovereign grace, you sent your Son, our one and only Savior, into the world to bear our sins and free us from death through his atoning death upon the cross and his resurrection. You call us and make us new again, and the old us passes away. We pray now that your word is heard here, not in our eyes and ears and hearts. To you and you alone belongs the glory and praise forevermore. And your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives today and evermore, who has broken the chains of death and sin and offers us reconciliation with God the Father, that we might not die in our sins, but have eternal life with you, praising God in paradise. Jesus calls us by your mercies, Savior, may we hear your call. Give our hearts in glad obedience, serve and love you best of all. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen and living Savior, we most humbly pray. Amen. On behalf of Robert Jones and myself, Ed LeCompte, we'd like to thank you for joining us again this week. Uh, we pray that the mercy and goodness that is the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and with all who believe this day and forevermore. Go in peace now. Amen. <laughs>